CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... traitor and spy are easily applied. Very often, however, events shape destinies. One man's bravery is another man's cowardice. To label a man is to tell what is outside. However, what is inside, what motivates even a hero to change color, is both the tragedy and the mystery of the ensuing hour. Mr. Stansbury... I have here a secret proclamation sent to me by General Washington of the American plan to invade Canada. 8,000 troops are expected from our ally, France, for that campaign. You said 8,000? The British wanted specifics. Well, specifics is what I'm giving you. Benedict, that information is secret. Are you sure that you should divulge... The die is cast, Peggy. There is no turning back. mystery drama, The Spy and the Traitor, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Gordon Heath. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Electra's all washed and loaded and you're on your way. You figured 300 miles the first day, but with all of Electra's luxury and room, you're out 400 miles before you know it. Not only that, but the EPA mileage estimates are 22 highway, 15 city, and 18 combined. That's with the standard 5.7 liter engine and automatic transmission. Of course, your mileage will vary depending on how and where you drive, your car's condition, and how it's equipped. And EPA estimates are lower in California. But it's nice to know that a car with as much prestige and elegance as Electra can also be efficient. Buick Electra, a car that can actually make you look forward to a long trip. They surely will astound you. The amazing things you see. Electra models are equipped with GM-built engines supplied by various divisions. See your dealer for details. He was 39 years old. A war hero, a loner, daring to do battle against odds and without orders, feared by the enemy and disliked by his soldiers. Were they jealous? Was there a place in revolutionary America for a brilliant general who had the reputation of being a one-man army? He was wounded in battle, decorated, and sent home at 39. He was engaged to marry a girl of 17. His name was Benedict Arnold. They all hate me. The army, Congress, everyone. Oh, not hate, Benedict. They're envious of you. Who in his right mind wouldn't be? You're the best general old George ever had. The best? You may be right, Peg. I have a feeling for fighting. I've had it since I was 13 in the French and Indian Wars. George Washington... A bullet never whistled past him till he was 21. I know General Washington appreciates your worth. I'm not so sure, Peggy. I wish he would speed up this ridiculous court-martial so that I could clear myself. Then I don't want to hear any more about it. Don't fuss so. Waiting. How I loathe it. And not having any command. Benedict Arnold, will you stop that? I've been put on the shelf, that's what it is. Ben, I'm going to change the subject, and I want you to pay full attention. You know we've been invited to the Messianza Fancy Dress Ball, and I want your advice. Do you think I would look well-dressed like a Turkish lady? Ben? Ben, are you listening to me? Five new major generals, and I was passed over. Ben, if you're going to go on and on over that stupid court-martial, when everyone knows you'll be cleared, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Who is it? Your 
your father. Oh, please come in, Father. I'm so upset. I'm afraid I am also. General Arnold was just here, and we parted under not too friendly terms. Hey, Margaret, I have something to say to you. He's so preoccupied with that dreary old court martial. All he thinks of is clearing himself so he can get a command and go back out there and get shot at. His leg is already terribly hurt. Every time I see him limping, it makes me cry. Uh, Margaret, you know that ball you and your sisters are making such a fuss over? I should think so. It's the most important social event in Philadelphia. Fuss indeed. Uh, will you please listen to me? Yes, Father. I have decided that in these times it would be unseemly for the Shippen family to spend their efforts on something as flippant as a fancy dress ball. Father! I myself have tried to remain neutral, but if my family takes part in such foolishness, we shall certainly be accused of, of making a mockery of the rebel cause. Father, I have to go to that ball. Major John Andre has asked me to. It's important. Uh, think, child. You are engaged to General Arnold, an American general. Not so very long ago, his superior, General Washington, asked 2,000 men to freeze and die at Valley Forge. You cannot be seen dancing with the British here in Philadelphia while widows are weeping over the graves of their soldier husbands. Oh, no. We have no money. No money coming in. As you know, when this city fell to the British, I decided not to help either side to wait it out. Oh, these, these are not times to indulge in lavish entertainments. It's this awful war... I wish that darned old George Washington had never gotten it into his head that we should be separated from Great Britain. It makes me so angry. Margaret, please keep that sentiment to yourself. We may be forced to swear allegiance to the American flag. Besides, there's much merit in their point of view. You may think so, Father, but I shall never... I hate this stupid revolution and what it's done to people of culture and breeding. Miss Peggy Shippen, I believe? Major John Andre, an honor. What an exquisite gown. Thank you. I hadn't expected you at the ball. Why not, Major Andre? Well, a little bird told me your father doesn't approve of such blatant luxury. The little bird was right. Father does not. But you are here anyway. Let us say when Peggy Shippen wishes her own way, she usually gets it. Usually? <laughs> Always. Uh, do you suppose your fiancé, General Arnold, will mind if I ask you to dance? The general would mind very much if you did not. A dance or two will make his absence more bearable for me. <sighs> Isn't it extraordinary? Here we are of the same heritage and background, General Arnold and myself. Yet one is a loyalist, the other a rebel. Major Andre, may I ask you to help me forget the war for one evening? Oh, it shall be a pleasure. Tell me, did you bring your scissors, Major? Uh, my scissors? Oh, why, yes, I did. How did you know about that? Your little bird. I understand you are quite accomplished in cutting out silhouettes of the ladies you dance with. I hope you'll do mine. I should be honored. Gracious! Is that a country dance the orchestra is playing? Why, yes, it is. Do I dare dance a country dance? And my dear Miss Shippen, it is we who must set the fashion for others to follow. But a country dance is so daring. Imagine moving about to music held in the arms of a man. A man not your husband, in public. Shall we give it a try? Let's. Oh, I can't wait. I am absolutely exhausted. Four whole country dances. Uh, Miss Shippen. I... Peggy. Well, good. Then I can be John to you. Peggy, a glass of punch? Oh, yes. I need something to revive me. Doesn't this awful revolution seem far away to you, John? One for you and one for me. To your health. Mmm. Thank you. No, the war is very close to me. Especially since my promotion to Deputy Adjutant General. I am impressed. 
You have new duties. Chiefly that of intelligence. The gathering of information. You mean spying? Oh, I've said too much already. Now, if you'll allow me, sit there like that in, in profile. And I'll take out my black paper and do your silhouette. Only in exchange. Exchange? May I see the scissors? Uh, here. Peggy, what are you doing? Snip, snip. A fair trade. A lock of your hair for my face on paper. <gasps> I must say, Peggy, for a young lady of your young years, I would say you are one of the most dangerous I have ever met. Because I cut off a lock of your hair as a keepsake? Uh, now, now, stop blinking your eyes and hold still. Ah, the nose. Ah, I would say you have all the earmarks of a headhunter. You flatter me. And if I know anything about that type of lady, one lock of hair won't satisfy you. You won't rest until you have my uh, entire head. Dan? Husband? Please come to bed. I'm coming, Peg, dear. Do you know what day it is today? Of course I know. The 8th, Tuesday. Is that all? 1779. Oh, Ben, today is our anniversary. It is, yes. One month married today. Ah, uh, yes. What is it, Ben? Don't I please you? Of course you do, Peg. It's obviously I who doesn't please you. I don't know what you see in me, crippled. I won't have you talking that way. You should have married a younger man like John Andre. Will you stop that? I love you. I know what is troubling you, and it's nothing to do with our marriage. It's a wonderful marriage. Perfect. It's old George, isn't it? And the Philadelphia Congress. It's really shocking. You're the country's hero, and you're being treated like I don't know what. I wonder, Peggy, if we can ever be happy in a land filled with upstarts and envy. Why do we have to? Are you saying... Why do we have to remain loyal to the American cause? Yes, I am. I think they're treating you shamefully. You never got your full commission. That ridiculous court-martial is put off from month to month, so you can't even face your accusers and clear your name. If you were a ranking officer in the British Army, you can be sure they would never treat a great man like that. No. They wouldn't. It must be a peculiar American trait to heap honors upon a man and when he has served his country well then to drag him down. Peggy, hey, are you saying we should consider going over to the British? What do you think? I wonder how one would go about it. John Andre might have an idea. He's in intelligence. And because we know him as a friend, he'd keep it a secret. Yes, John Andre. I remember being a little jealous of him and his attentions to you, Peg. Little did I think someday I might need him. Yes? Is this the pen mansion? Yes. General Benedict Arnold? Yes. Sansbury is the name. I've been informed you are a gentleman interested in the finer things of life, and I have brought with me from Philadelphia some articles of rare distinction which I believe you will appreciate. May I come in? All right. Do so. Are we alone? My wife is upstairs, and of course the servants are about. Uh, yes, I brought with me some exquisite Staffordshire and creamware. My wife attends to the household effects. Is there any place we can talk, General, without being overheard by the, by the servants? Oh, I see. Perhaps in the garden. In the garden. Splendid. Yes, beautiful spot you have here, General. Is that West Point directly south? Why, yes, it is. My wife and I have only recently purchased this property. Yes, I'd like to see a bit more of the Penn Mansion grounds, if I may. And if you'll come with me outside to my carriage, I have some extraordinary samples fit for a connoisseur. It's an opportunity I don't think you would like to pass up. 
Is this strange man selling porcelain or Great Britain? It's one thing to think about changing one's allegiance, another to take action. But when one is faced with a wall of delays making it impossible to clear oneself, when one is suspended from rank and duty without a trial, perhaps that first step is not such a big one. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. We're going to stick our neck out and tell you something. It's hard to miss with Arrow. Arrow shirts. And the reason is so simple. America shirt maker is Arrow shirts. America's shirt maker has done it again with what is probably the best shirt collar ever made. Arrow's patented custom collar, and only Arrow's got it. It's a whole inch wider at the bottom than the top, just like your neck is. It's adjustable by a full half inch, and it's got a special notch so the neckband doesn't show over your top. America Shirt Maker is Arrow Shirt. See why we're sticking our neck out. Stick your neck into an Arrow custom collar. America Shirt Maker is Arrow if we're not already your assured maker, we ought to be. It is not the act, but what compels the act. Why does a man cheat at cards, lose a job, even kill another? How often have we been told the fault lies not in our stars, but in ourselves? Here we have a man of great courage, a winner of battles, a gainer of medals, who is about to desert his country. Well, let us see if we can pluck out the heart of this man's mystery. Word has gone out to Major Andre that Benedict Arnold wished to defect. Now the British reply has come knocking at his door. I have brought with me a personal message from Major Andre. Proceed. You sent him a note asking to be assured the British were not planning to give up the war. The answer to your question is assurances are given. Good. You asked for suitable pay from the British as inducement. No, not inducement. Compensation. Major Andre in Greece in principle that you should be uh, compensated, but does not agree to the specific sum you requested. Oh. He directs me to tell you the amount will depend upon what services you render to the British. And what about my question? Should I openly go over to the British side now? Uh, the Major says no, not now. To continue as you are, serve us in secret. Has the Major asked for an immediate answer? I've brought along a dictionary identical to one at British headquarters. Your reply is to be written each word corresponding with the page and line in this dictionary. I understand. My correspondence is entirely numbers. The Major suggests your wife write an innocent letter addressed to one of her Philadelphia friends. She write? Something innocuous, inquiring as to what's doing in society, are they fancy dress balls, whatever. And you are to write your coded, numbered message in uh, invisible ink between the lines. I don't care for it, Stansbury. Involving an innocent lady friend of my wife's. <laughs> the letter will be intercepted, General. It will never reach the party. I suggest you put your thoughts down on paper. I'll return to Penn Mansion in an hour for your answer. Answer? What answer? For the name of the person to whom your messages for Major Andre will be addressed. I cannot promise you that. I shall have to consult my wife. A messenger? When was he here? He has just left. What did John say to your proposal? Tell me. Tell me. The British don't want me to publicly change sides. But why not? I don't understand. They want me to secure a command I can betray. But how can I? Washington is holding off, giving me a post until this wretched court-martial is over and there's no date set for it to begin. What about the money? Nothing definite. Oh, yes, they'd be delighted for me to tell them of troop movements, secret dispatches, etc. Anything I wish, but Andre refuses to name any specific amount. But you ask for so little, 10,000 pounds. We'll write back to John Andre. Peggy, 
draft up some letter about hats or gowns or whatever. I'll make notes on my views and perhaps, yes, give them some incidental intelligence just to whet their appetite. This messenger who's coming back, is our letter to be given to him? No, we're to tell him who in Philadelphia we're writing to. I'll write directly to John himself. Why not? You must be out of your mind. Write directly to Andre. Why, you might as well take your carriage and drive to British headquarters or shout our intentions from the housetops. This must be done in secret. All right, then. I'll address the letter to my father. Now you're talking sensibly. I hope something comes of this. How are you going to send your part of the letter, Ben? Using this dictionary as a code book and writing between the lines of your letter in invisible ink. I see the dictionary, but where's the ink? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? How they ever expect to win this war. That fool agent never gave me any ink. Dear father, I am well and happy and to be the wife of this great man has filled my heart and my days. Would you be good enough to forward this letter to our dear friend, Major John Andre? I have asked him the next time he goes to New York, would he buy me material for a pale pink dress of Mantua, decorated with broad ribbon of the same color. John Andre will now... Same color. John Andre will know as we spoke of such material when last we danced at the Mechianza Fancy Dress Ball. Also satin for matching shoes and... One pair of ladies' neat spurs. Love to Mama and the girls, your daughter, Margaret. Williams, bring me a candle in that dictionary in the far left-hand corner of the bookcase, and then leave me. I'm not to be disturbed. Good. It's all decoded now. Now let me see. As my life and everything is at stake, I shall expect a certainty... As to what amount you will pay me. Herewith some current intelligence. General Wa- Washington is going to the H- Hudson. C has given up. C Congress has given up C Tun Charleston. Congress has given up Charleston. They are in want of arms, men, ammunition to defend it. Your garden is quite as lovely as I remember it, General Arnold. You will forgive me if I don't get up. I've had these chairs placed out here at various intervals so I could rest. Oh, forgive me. May I bring you a cushion from my carriage to make your back more comfortable? I shall feel more at ease, Stansbury, if you bring me favorable news from the Major. He's received our letters. Uh, Yes, and has entrusted me with the answer. We are to drop the dictionary code. He now fears that the correspondence may fall into the wrong hands and your cooperation is too valuable to risk. Then he agrees. Uh, To an extent. To the extent of 10,000 pounds in my terms? Uh, No. The Major cannot see any payments to yourselves until you have made a real and generous effort. He suggests you make a little exertion. Are those his words? Uh, Verbatim. And procure an accurate plan of West Point. Uh, boats guarding the Hudson River, etc., etc. And also the American Army's battle orders. Andre doesn't realize the problems. No, I don't like this method of communication. Letters, cold, second-hand replies by agents. <laughs> you will forgive me, Stansbury. Most unsatisfactory. Ah, which brings me to my next point, General. The Major says if you could enable him to see you, he is convinced a personal conversation would satisfy the both of you entirely. Ah, no. To meet him face to face, yes, yes. Tell the Major I am of like mind. I shall arrange it. Is it, Father? A little after the noon hour. I'm beside myself with worry. How long does a court martial take? I, I don't know, Margaret. Benedict has been dragged into this hearing by enemies, but I know he'll come through it with flying colors. 
Just you wait and see. Yes, I, I have no doubt of it. Father, I wish you could be more charitable. No, no, no. Come along, Margaret. How can you say that? You no longer were able to afford the Penn Mansion. Who put this house at your disposal? Hmm? Father, I didn't mean that. I told you both it's yours to keep it. I want you to have some place where you can be happy with no worries of mortgages or unpaid bills. We shall have money, you'll see. The Philadelphia Congress owes Ben 5,000 pounds a month for the nine months he had to keep his establishment as commandant of Philadelphia. That's him. He's back. Ben? Ben, we're here in the drawing room by the fire. Another brandy, General? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Shippen. One was enough to help me recover. Do you feel up to telling us now the outcome of the court-martial? Are you well enough? My dearest, I never felt better. At least this trial has taught me who my friends are. Who spoke up for you? No one. Not a soul. I had no friends. But you were acquitted. Do you remember the story of King Solomon, who, when asked to decide which lady was the true mother of a baby, ordered the infant cut in half and half given to each woman? Yes. Yes, and the true mother rejected that. She would rather have her child alive, even in another woman's hand. I feel exactly like a mother whose child has been returned to her cut in half. The verdict was half for me and half against. But like King Solomon's child, my reputation is dead. I was exonerated of some charges but found guilty elsewhere. Nothing specific. Words like improper conduct, imprudent, were thrown at me like dice. Yeah, but how could they do that, General? Were they not dealing in facts, uh, specific accusations? When you are disliked, Mr. Shippen, anyone can dig into the articles of war and come up with some catch-all to hang you. Oh, my darling, how wicked are They them. wanted my blood, and they found the catch-article all right. One that forbids without being specific, mind you. Anything an officer might do to quote the prejudice of good order or military discipline. The hardest blow of all was the sentence. But if they acquitted you... I am to receive a reprimand in writing from General Washington. Now, Mr. Shippen, I am very tired. I did not sleep at all last night. It was good of you to visit and be here when I returned. Now... If you would be so kind as to leave my wife and myself. I had to talk to you alone, Peggy. Any word as to your meeting with Major Andre? Not when I left the house this morning, but I've been gathering some important news for him. Peggy, we must face the truth. America has turned its back on me. Had I ever any doubts about joining the British, they are dispelled now. Yes? Father, I thought you had gone home. Were you... I mean, have you been standing outside the door all this while? Uh, no, no, I was waiting for my carriage when a gentleman came to the door and asked to see you, General. I thought perhaps I should announce him. Who is it, Father? His name is Stansbury. Who was that gentleman who just left? My father. Ah, uh, General, General, I wonder. That is, if Mrs. Arnold does not mind if you and I... Mrs. Arnold and I are in this together. She will remain by my side. Before you say anything, Mr. Stansbury, to show my cooperation, I'll give you some information. Why, excellent. I have here a proclamation sent to me in secret by General Washington. The American plan to invade Canada. 8,000 troops are expected from France for that campaign. Well, that is new. Major Andre wanted my specifics, did he? Ben, Benedict. What is it? You are sure. The die is cast, Peggy. There is no turning back. Where was I? Yes, our invasion, I mean... The American invasion of Canada. Six French ships of the line, several frigates, and a number of transports carrying the 8,000 are expected at Newport, Rhode Island in three weeks. 
You may tell Major Andre I shall see Washington myself, and I guarantee I shall be offered the command of West Point. Tell him also, when I meet with the Major face to face, he will have from me a complete report on how that garrison can be taken by the British. A sad day for patriots. The man was noble, but with his last attempt he wiped it out, betrayed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. William Shakespeare's prophetic words written 100 years before Benedict Arnold's betrayal. I shall be back shortly with Act Three. The warm, sunny days of spring are the perfect time to paint your house. The National True Test Paint Week is the perfect time to buy True Test House Paint from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you, now until June the 4th, they offer True Test Paints at special prices. For example, you can get True Test Woodsman Solid Color Latex Stain for just $6.99 a gallon. Woodsman enhances the texture of rough wood and beautifies smooth wood, indoors or out. And it comes in 22 rustic flat colors. Or choose True Test Weatherall Acrylic Latex House Paint, the paint that's earned a good housekeeping seal, for just $9.97 a gallon at True Value Hardware Stores. It resists weather, stains, and smog, and comes in white and 35 colors. So take advantage of the special values on True Test Paints during National True Test Paint Week, now until June the 4th at participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. And remember that True Value is much more than just a name. It's our way of doing business. And tell them Pat Summerall sent you. night. Benedict Arnold, his wounded leg propped up beside him, is being rowed to a secret rendezvous near Dobbs Ferry. Thirty months of glory, of battle scars and battle honors, and thirty more months of suspicion, disgrace, and despair lie behind him. There is no turning back now. Under the false flag of truce, the British major and the American general, the spy and the traitor are about to meet. Arnold? Andre? I've been waiting for you. When did you arrive? A few hours ago. Down there. Look over the cliff. Can you make out a mast? No, no, no. Don't get up. I know your foot is a great bother. I waited till it was dark. So you came by ship? Yes, the vulture. Are you alone, Benedict? Yes, John. You? I left Stansbury on the beach below. A useful man. He knows this whole area on both sides of the Hudson like the back of his hand. How is Peggy? Oh, this adventure doesn't sit well with her. I understand you have a baby. Congratulations. A oh boy. That doesn't make the strain on Peg any easier. But she insists on knowing everything I do every step of the way. I'm sorry the court-martial did not go well for you, Benedict. It was the next to last straw. Was there a last straw? Oh, yes. Old George himself had to write to me. My actions were improper. But I made him eat his words, which he yet doesn't realize. I don't quite understand. It was simple. I made him ashamed that he had to reprimand me. So from there, it was only a step to get him to agree I should be the commander of West Point. Yes, old George will learn how foolish it is not to be loyal to Benedict Arnold. That's good news. When do you take command? Soon. But I haven't been twiddling my thumbs, waiting. Now, I have brought with me, John, a detailed drawing of the fortifications. Drew it myself. Here, put it in your pocket. Now, here are my recommendations how best to storm them. Oh, I wish I could take a look at these. We can't light any lanterns here. My guess is, John, if you were to attack West Point before Albany could send reinforcements, the garrison would be yours. Oh, if we had it, uh, our guns trained on the river and inland, why, all New England could be cut off from the rest of the colonies. Main supplies, everything. And what's that worth to you and your generals? You said 10,000 pounds when last we talked. The price has gone up to 20. Yes, but not for a pile of stones and burnt-out cannon. Add 3,000 prisoners and all the stores, then we would be agreeable. Is that an owl or a signal? It may be Stansbury signaling. Let's hope it's not trouble. Major. 
Major Andre. Yes, Stansbury, what is it? The boatman, sir. The one who rowed us from the Vulture. I took a tour of the beach to keep my eyes open for the enemy patrol. And when I returned, the boatman was gone. I didn't believe him. He told me if the hour grew late, he wouldn't be able to row me back. But I didn't believe him. Will he come back for us in the morning, sir? Oh, one would hope so, but who knows? All right, Stansbury, back to your watch down at the river's edge. I'll call you when I need you. Uh, yes, sir. But don't worry, sir. I'll keep my eyes open. It's not a pleasant sensation being in enemy territory. What if there's no boatman in the morning? What then? Your agent, Stansbury, has a house nearby, doesn't he? About a mile up river? Yes, he has. Then that's where you and I shall spend the night. It'll give us more time for me to explain the drawings and specifications. John, wake up. I'll have Stansbury make us some coffee. Stansbury? Stansbury! Oh, I could have sworn I didn't sleep a wink. He's not here. And his cot hasn't been slept in. Well, if I know him, he's waiting on the shore for that boatman. I want to give you these papers as well before I forget. The ordinance at West Point, guns available, number of men protecting each fort. Then, here, secret plans of the artillery commander in case of attack. Here, Washington's own top secret military plans. I'd say I could guarantee you at least 3,000 prisoners. If so, the 20,000 pounds are yours. I knew you would see it my way. Expensive soldiers. I don't haggle. The price has gone up in 17 centuries. I don't follow you. One used to be able to buy a man's freedom for 30 pieces of silver. John, I don't care for that. If you British have any second thoughts about doing business with me, please come out and say so. I'm not in the least ashamed of what I'm doing. But neither am I, Benedict. It was thoughtless. It was a thoughtless remark. Put it down to my fears of how I can get safely back to Philadelphia. Peter! General! Come in, Stansbury. I've been on the beach since five this morning. The boatman didn't return? No, he didn't. But even if he had, there's no warship to take you on. What? The vulture is gone. One of the local farmers told me he saw it pull anchor and disappear last night. Well, how am I going to get back to our lines undetected? I'd say it's time to consider escape plan number two. Stansbury, I want you to show the Major the way over land. Stay with him. Of course I will. I've done it many times. On horseback, in my British uniform? You want me to be shot? I'll give you letters of passage. They'll have to let you through the lines. I can give you a long cloak instead of your jacket, sir. Then your breeches and boots won't be seen. Capital. Believe me, John, it's quite safe. To spend the rest of the war in a prison camp. Unthinkable. Were it not for my bad leg, I'd accompany you myself. There's no danger, John. Look, if I had any doubts, would I even consider you carrying these incriminating documents? You're certain. I risk everything also, John. The papers you carry could send me to the gallows. Oh, my darling. I am so happy that you've returned safely. I worried so. Did everything go as you planned? Not quite, Peggy. But I feel sure Major Andre will get back safely. All morning I've been walking about this house and thinking soon, soon, soon... Soon I shall be with my own people. The kind of people I deserve to associate with. Not the American riffraff. In a few days, West Point will be delivered. In just a few days. Uh, perhaps a bit longer than that, but it will be. The baby. I must go to him. Peggy. Would you remember one thing? There are a thousand things about you I can never forget, Ben. What one thing? Last night, when I was returning home, riding alone, I prayed that whatever might happen to me, you would always remember our happy days together. How you talk. Our happiest days are yet to come. Yes, 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 coming. Stansbury, back so soon? What are you doing here this time of night? Let me in. Quickly. 
But do you realize it's three o'clock in the morning? All is lost, General. What do you mean? They captured us, Major Andre and myself. I managed to escape. Oh, good Lord. What is it? What's the matter? I'm, I'm sorry to intrude at this late hour, Mrs. Arnold, but... I... John Andre has been captured. No. Go ahead, Stansbury. Tell me how, when, and where. We had come as far as Tarrytown, sir. The British outpost at White Plains, only 15 miles away, when three men, armed, stopped us. The Major handed them the General's pass, your pass, sir. I don't think the man could read it. Then he shouted, You said you were a British officer. Where is your money? I have none, said Major Andre. They didn't believe him. You are a British officer and no money. Search him. They did. They stripped him. Oh, how dreadful. The moment I saw them ahead on the road, barring the way, I said to the Major, Let's climb up to the right. We'll be hidden in the forest. He would have none of it, but rode straight into their arms. I hid myself and observed the entire capture. Then they found the papers. General, your plans for the taking of West Point. All is over. All is lost. The other two stood around while the biggest tried to make out what the papers meant. And then, at last, he said, This man is a spy. Oh, no. Please. Please, Peggy. Don't go on so. Ben. Then they'll find out. They will accuse you, crucify you. You will be called a traitor. You must save yourself. You must go. Now, tonight. Not lose an instant. General Washington, sir. I have had much time to reflect since my escape and the sentencing of Major John Andre. I know the world will accuse me for what I have done as wrong. Believe me, sir, I have ever acted from a principle of love of my country. Too often have I, in the past, experienced the ingratitude of my country. I ask not, therefore, for any favor for myself only that you extend your hand, sir, to protect Mrs. Arnold. I beg she may be permitted to return to her father in Philadelphia. I am alone to blame. No one must share my grief other than myself. Your faithful servant, Benedict Arnold. What news, Taylor? General Washington has approved the sentence that you're to be executed as a spy, Major Andre. I foresaw my fate. Is there anything else, Major? I am the victim of misfortune, not guilt. When is the hour? Tomorrow at five o'clock in the afternoon. I do have one last request. May I be executed as a professional soldier? Yes, sir. To die like a gentleman and a soldier. Shot. Not hanged as a peasant and a spy. I am, after all, still the adjutant general of the British Army. Hanged? They hanged that great man like a common criminal. Hey, Margaret, you must calm yourself. I have no one. You know that no one. Benedict has deserted me. I'm all alone with my baby. Please, please. I haven't a friend left in the world. Do you know that? I did have a friend once. A good, kindly good friend. Yes, I did. Look, sir. He was my only true friend. This was his. That lock of hair? A long time ago. At my very first ball, John Andre gave me this lock of his hair. He let me cut it from his head. Do you know what he said to me, sir? Margaret. He said, Peggy, I know you. You won't be satisfied with one lock of my hair. You won't rest until you have my entire head. Oh, dear Lord. What have I done?
Peggy Shippen Arnold, once an innocent and lovely belle of the ball. Did anyone grieve for her? John Andre, once a man of charm and talent, who mourned for him? The British Army did, and a memorial to him stands to this day in Westminster Abbey. Benedict Arnold, for him no one shed a tear. Once a hero, but forever is he remembered in history as a traitor. I shall return shortly with a few more thoughts on this tragedy. As we look back today at the sad tale of spy and traitor, let us remember there were also very many patriots. One of them, in uniform with Washington, said, These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Said by Tom Paine in 1776. Today, we can say it no better. Our cast included Gordon Heath, Catherine Byers, Howard Ross, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.